2 Kings chapter 2 and verse number 9 reads like this. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Welcome to Double Portion Podcast. Aggravating circumstances in my life. Double Portion family. This is a special edition of the Double Portion podcast with your host. Normally it would be Jeffrey Elder and Mitchell Elder, but today it's only Bishop Paul Elder because we are in the beautiful city of Beirut, Lebanon, and we are here live with special guest, Brother and Sister Azar and their family, Brother Jacob and Sister Joy, and with Brother and Sister Hicks and my beautiful wife and my beautiful daughter. And we've been having a wonderful time for the last week. And so we wanted to include all of you to let you know the great work that God is doing here in this beautiful country of Lebanon. I want to say thank you to all of our listeners and all of our viewers. This week it will only be viewed, our listening, excuse me, because we didn't have the ability to pack all of our stuff with us over here. But we are just so thrilled. We have now hit over 3,500 downloads and uh, we've got some prizes that are coming up here in just a few days. So stay tuned. We also want to let you know right up front, you're welcome to uh, email us or message us on Double Portion Podcast, Instagram, Facebook, and let us know what you think. We are just so thrilled that you have become a part of the Double Portion Podcast family. Well, in the studio with us today, I do have Pastor Azar and his son, Brother Jacob Azar. And I want to say to you, Pastor Azar, we welcome you to the Double Portion Podcast. We're so thrilled that you're with us today. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you. And we're so thrilled to have Jacob with us. It's an honor to be with you all. Thank you for having us. We are just thrilled. I would love to... Uh, Brother Azar, you spent many years in the United States, but you are a citizen of Lebanon. Is that true? That's true. You were born here in Beirut. That's right. So take us through some of the process of your birth and how you came to know the Lord. And and I heard you talking with Brother Strix the other day about you actually were here during the Civil War. And that's very interesting to see how God protected you, brought you through that, and brought you into the truth. So uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yes, sir. First, thank you for the privilege to be on the podcast uh, tonight. I was uh, born in, in Beirut, Lebanon. And I grew up in the Civil War throughout the 70s and the 80s and uh, left Beirut uh, in 1990, uh, three days before the war ended, before they invaded our East part of Beirut, which actually we are in right now. Uh, but uh, I, I uh, came from a, a Greek Orthodox background and um, uh, grew up in the city. Of course, at when I was born, the war was has already begun, and it was with uh, a lot of different groups. Um, it was a very um, that's all what we knew. We knew the war. There was a lot of bombing. Um, uh, kidnapping, uh, suicide bombers, and that was the uh, environment that we grew up in. And uh, I remember as I uh, grew older, you know, I, I, I always had a dream that one day I'm going to leave Lebanon and I'm going to go to a better place. And um, the worst years of the war was actually when I was about 
14, 15 years old, and 88, uh, 89, and 90. These last two years before we left, they were the worst years in the war. And um, I escaped a little bit outside of the city and uh, spent there about eight, nine months at a, at a place by the, by the sea. And uh, I remember I used to look uh, uh, to this uh, to this uh, sea line uh, as as far as I can I can uh, look, and I would say uh, one day I'm gonna uh, escape this place to a better place. And I would watch uh, Beirut being bombed at night, and uh, but you know, uh, always always wanted to make a better life. Always wanted to leave this place because everything we knew was was uh, war and death. A lot of my friends died, and um, uh, God spared our lives several times to different bombings, fell falling uh, within distance uh, from us. And uh, excuse me, in uh, 1990, uh, my dad called me uh, out of the blue, and uh, first he wanted to come and see me. When he came to see me, he wanted to take some pictures. He said, "There's a possibility that I would might be able to send you out uh, with your brothers over to Europe." Now, of course, that was a, a dream, and it was really an impossibility. You know, this is when we, we are living at a time when we have lost complete hope. Our, our part of the city was under siege. We were being bombed every day, and it was just a matter of time when you would be next, when you would die next. And, um, of course, the sounds of the bombs were very frightening and, and so forth. So we lived in that, in that atmosphere. When my dad came and told me there's a possibility, I said that that would take a miracle. That would take, because at that time all the embassies had left Lebanon. They were closed. Government was shut down. You can't even make a passport to leave, and you can make it outside the city. We were on a siege. The airport was in West Beirut, and I was never uh, uh, never went to West Beirut because it was not in our. It wasn't safe for Christians to go there at that time. The only way out would be at that time is taking a ship and try to leave from. Uh, uh, to, to Cyprus, to the island there, and from Cyprus to leave from there. But even ships were being bombed trying to enter and leave the port city. And so uh, uh, my dad took the pictures and two weeks later he called me and he said, well, I, I uh, made passports and uh, uh, got your visas on these passports and um, got the Swiss government to uh, uh, accept you that you can leave to Switzerland and uh, uh, you and, uh, and uh, three of my older brothers. And so uh, it was really an amazing deal. I still did not really kind of believe it that this is happening, but uh, uh, God at that time, about 35 years ago, he, he had some friends that uh, were, were influential and they opened the, the government building, made us passport, closed it back up and uh, uh, he took the passports, flew to Cyprus, and uh, there the Swiss ambassador gave him visas. So, uh, came back to Lebanon and um, told us that we were ready to go. So he appointed a day, and he told us at that day there is that uh, border point that I want you to cross that border point, and uh, uh, I will be meeting you on the other side, and uh, I'll take you inside there into uh, what was known at that time was the Bristol Hotel, which is in West Beirut. And, uh, my dad knew the owner. Uh, and uh, so it was an appointed time. I believe it was like right in the evening, maybe 5 p.m. or so, uh, that me and my three brothers, we all had backpacks on our shoulder. And uh, uh, we had to run maybe for about, I would say, at least two miles, a mile and a half or so among, among sand uh, hills. They had mines inside of them, and uh, we had to move quickly so snipers couldn't get us while we were crossing the border. And, uh, and so we put our backpack on, and that was decided this is our way to, to freedom, to life. And we started, uh, we started running among, uh, crossing the borderline. And uh, thank God we, we all made it. We crossed over when we passed to the other side. Uh, we had my dad and some of his friends who were with the uh, uh, army at that time were waiting for us on the other side. And so they took us in vehicles and drove us into West Beirut, which is a place that at that time, during the Civil War, Christians do not go there. And, uh, but uh, we went and uh, we, we went straight to the Bristol Hotel and there we hid for two weeks. 
in two weeks, we, you know, we didn't leave the hotel because it was dangerous for us. Um, of course, there, the, at that time, during that civil war, almost every uh, terrorist organization was in, in Beirut. You know, we had the PLO, we had Hamas, we had all, you can name it, just all kind of different groups. But, uh, um, so we were waiting and, and there was one plane that would leave from Beirut to Zurich every Wednesday. And that plane was packed for a month. And uh, we couldn't, there was very little flight leaving the Beirut in West Beirut uh, airport. And, uh, but my dad knew that uh, on October 13, 1990, that they were going to invade the eastern part of our city. And he had to get us on, the, on that plane, which was on October 10th, it was a Wednesday. And so uh, God made a way and uh, through some connections, they removed some people out of the plane canceled their tickets and they, they put us on that plane and uh, they have uh, shipped us. I remember when I went to the, to the airport, my dad, they, there was a, 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 a convoy that has taken us from the hotel all the way to the airport. We probably went through 15 different uh, uh, stop uh, checkpoints and uh, we had army in the front, army in the back and God just let us through miraculously and every time we get to the checkpoints I just like had it in my heart are, are they gonna take us or are we gonna go through it and God had made a way when we got to the airport uh, of course the airport at that time was very very difficult place to be all kind of agencies were there and uh, God had made a way we passed through all the stops inside the airport and when we got to the last stop which is immigration one of the men said no you cannot leave and, and uh, we said, why? He said, well, because your visa is from Cyprus and you've never been to Cyprus. So that visa must not be real. And so, and this is when I really my heart hit the floor. We, we went this far and this was the last door to go to, to, uh, to make it to the plane and leave. And um, uh, so my dad, again, made some, some phone calls and uh, we, had, we had some people involved and they were finally, they let us, go to the plane. And I remember when I was walking on the plane, I told myself, I will not look back because I will never come back to Lebanon. Mm -hmm. If I make it to this plane, I'm never coming back. And, uh, and until this day, I remember going up the stairs, you know, at that, that time they'll take you to the bus to, uh, uh, to the plane. And as I was going up to the stairs, uh, just the uh, stairs of the plane, I, I just would not want to look back because once I got into that plane, I told myself, I'm never coming back. And so, uh, and, uh, so the plane took off, and when the plane took off, it was just a, 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 an amazing, I've never been on planes before, I never really thought that I would leave Lebanon, a place of destruction, a place where there's no hope, a place where, where you, feel like, you feel like you're in a prison, and uh, it's like you're sentenced to die, you just don't know when. And, um, and so we made it to Zurich, and when I got to Zurich there, the, uh, the Swiss police was waiting for us and they took us and they processed our papers and uh, we went there as, as political refugees uh, into Switzerland and, uh, and there they took us into a camp on the border of Austria and uh, it was a long trip from Zurich uh, to the camp. We got there maybe around midnight when we went to the camp, we woke up the next morning and I remember looking out the window seeing these Swiss Alps. I thought, man, this surely this is paradise, you know, coming from a a place where there was a lot of destruction and, and killing and, uh, and there you go and everything is so nice and neat. And, uh, so we, we, we stayed there Thursday, Friday, Saturday morning. I was drinking coffee in the morning at the, at the coffee shop and there at, I was looking at the uh, television and uh, the watching there was a news going on and I could see uh, the invasion that was uh, being on the news channel of them invading our part of the city, the eastern part of Beirut, which we are right here, right now. Uh, of course, I did not know that they were fixing to invade, but my dad did. And, uh, uh, and, and all the, the, the bombing and the killing that took place, the massacre that took place at that time. And I couldn't help but to think that I told myself, I still remember this today, I said, surely God has a reason that he spared my life. Uh, it was a miraculous way how we escaped. and. Uh, and how God spared my life. How old were you when you boarded that plane? 
I was uh, short, one month short of being 17 years old. So we reach on this podcast a lot of young men and young ladies. And you know, it's heartbreaking, Brother Azar, but many of them feel that hopelessness. Yeah. They're not in the position of, you know, their life being threatened by war, but they're in places of bondage to sin things that have stolen their dreams and taken away their faith. So talk to those young men and those young ladies about, you know, did you pray at that time? Did you feel like that God could help you get through that? It, because many of them feel the same way you do. They just feel like there's no way out. There's right. just, it's impossible. So talk to those young men and those young ladies. Well, um, years later, uh, the Lord reminded me of an event that took place when I was young here in Lebanon. And it was a very uh, dark night. It was a dark night in my life. And I remember as maybe I was at that time, maybe 10 or 12 years old. And uh, I, I went outside, found a rock. And I sat on the rock and I looked out to the heavens, to the stars. And I cried out to God, asking God to help me. I didn't know him didn't know who, who he was and uh, uh, years later when I, when God had, had filled me with the Holy Ghost, he reminded me of that event. He said, even when you didn't know me, when you cried out to me, I heard you cry and I moved on your behalf. And, uh, um, uh, you know, of course, it was devastating seeing what has taken place. And I realized that uh, uh, nothing, these things does not happen without without God, without God sparing. You know, many times we go through life and we really cannot put the puzzle together. But I, I've 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 came to the to the knowledge that if we if we seek God and completely walk with him, we'll be able to look back and see the hand of God in a lot of different stops in our life, how God worked things out that that God has has done for us. And uh, uh, you know from that moment uh, I started. I started yielding to the Lord. I started wanting to know Him, wanting to know who God is and what's His purpose. We 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 stayed alive for a reason. I remember right here, not far from Sibon, when we were further on the other side of the streets. I was crossing a border, and the the person in front of me was sniped. And I remember him falling on the ground. And the people were behind me, panicking. I should. I could have been that person. And uh, uh, so I. I we look and, re and remember these times, the, how God spared our lives. And it could be in car accident, it could be in somehow. But I want to tell somebody who's listening, if God has spared your life and you can remember that, uh, God has a purpose. Yes. So you made it to Zurich. How did you come to, to the truth? What Talk to us about how the Lord led you in to... Uh, this great gospel, repent of your sins, and was baptized in Jesus' name. Because I know you were raised uh, Greek Orthodox, which is a form of Catholic. So right. uh, tell us how God drew you into the truth. Well, the first the first three months were were very hard in Switzerland. Of course, I didn't speak the German language. Uh, I didn't know anybody, and uh, uh, we went into a very very difficult time. In my life, there was there was times I remember these three months. There's times we were so hungry we would go to the bathroom, drink water to fill up our stomach because we didn't sleep at night from being hungry. My brother and I, and we we really struggled. Uh, we couldn't leave the place where we we're at. And I remember uh, two months and a half after being in that place, uh, we were we were so desperate to, for God to help us that uh, there was a room right next to my bedroom. It was an unfinished room and, and I went there and uh, I knelt on my knees and I, 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 there was nobody to help me. I couldn't reach out to anybody, but I, but I went to that room and I, I knelt and I started praying. I started crying out to God to help me, to pull me out of that situation. Uh, I, you know, we experienced war in Lebanon, but we didn't experience hunger. And uh, in Switzerland, the first at that time, we experienced hunger and difficult situation. And I remember while I was praying, I felt like a light shined right next to me, very strong light. There was such a strong presence that I was so 
uh, 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 in, in frightened from that presence right next to me. And I, not in the way that I was afraid, but I knew that, that there was a, a someone that, that God had, had came to the room that while I was praying. And, uh, um, uh, and then I felt a great peace of when, when, when that has taken place. Uh, but I would, I wouldn't dare to look. And I knew, I knew that God was moved. And, and within, uh, within one week, I met a person in, in Switzerland that, uh, uh, took me in and, uh, gave me a job and God giving me favor with him. And, uh, in that job, uh, it was it was an electric engineering company, and I was the the boy that would uh, you know clean the offices, clean the trash after you know the engineers and, and clean their baskets and, and their offices, things like that. And uh, and I didn't mind working. I was so happy to get that job. And uh, um, and uh, yet God gave me favor with the owner of that company. I still remember his name was Jacob Hefty. I named my son after him after uh, many years, but. Uh, uh, I remember Mr. Mr. Jacob had, had he was a God fearing man and uh, took me in, started sending me to school. So I would, and uh, got me into the office with his son. I started studying electric design, taught me all CAD, and and then I would go to school one day and just promoted me and gave me a raise and wanted me to take me to his home and take care of me. And uh, um, and so God God had really started promoting me at work and. Uh, I became an electric designer and working with, with electric engineering. And um, so I lived, I lived in Zurich for, for about uh, almost three years. And one day on a Sunday, I was going to visit some of my uh, friends who left Lebanon. They survived the war and they moved to other parts of Switzerland. And so I took the train and I was going to go uh, to visit them. It was about a two hour trip in the train. And uh, I lived in a town called Wetzigen. And uh, my train had to go into a town called Busto, and then you go to downtown Zurich. And uh, in downtown Zurich, I was supposed to change trains and take another train, go to where these uh, friends are. So when my train stopped in Busto, uh, I thought to myself, well, uh, I saw uh, somebody sells flowers. So I went quickly out of the train, bought some flowers to take them to my friends that I'm visiting. And while I was in the train, the flowers really look cheap. So I got to downtown, downtown Zurich and I had 20 minutes in downtown Zurich. I said, well, maybe I'll go and find me some more, something better. So right there, there was a, uh, an, uh, an escalator and, I, and I, I, took, I took it out and right there, there was a flower shop. So I walked through that flower shop and I was looking around. While I was looking around, there was a tall elderly lady and her hair was white all wrapped up together. And uh, she was standing in front of me and when she turned around, she said, hello. And when she said hello, I felt like a warmth come from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And she asked me if I spoke English and I said, I do. I, I learned English in Lebanon. And, uh, and so she introduced me to her daughter and her uh, other daughter and her son-in-law. And they told me that they were on a tour touring Europe. And that was the last stop. And they had two hours before they took the train back to the airport to fly back to Atlanta, Georgia. And so I wanted to know who she was and what I have felt when, when she said hello to me. I, I decided to cancel my trip and invite them for coffee. You know, uh, I've learned that later through life that some folks, you know, they, they feel God and, 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 uh, and, but yet they go on with their life. But there are others that said they slam on the brakes and wait. I got to look into that and I got to look into that treasure and uh, they ended up getting the Holy Ghost. Amen. Yes. Um, and so I, I went, invited them for coffee and I learned, I learned that later that they were, she wasn't going to go on that trip, on that tour. But in prayer, God told her to go on that tour that she was going to meet somebody that needs her. Mm -hmm. And so every day she would stop, she'd say hello, hello. And that was the last stop. And so when I invited them for coffee, she told me that her husband was a Pentecostal preacher out of Orange, Texas, and uh, that he just had uh, passed away maybe the year prior. And, uh, uh, and she was here on a tour, touring, touring Europe. And she started telling me about the Holy Ghost, about God. Now, of course, this was all strange to me because coming from a Greek Orthodox background, I didn't really, you know, very much believe in any of that. But I, I believe that God is real. And, um, 
And so uh, I, 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 she gave me her, her phone number, her information in the States, and she took mine, and, and they all went from there to the airport, flew back to Atlanta, and I went back home. And uh, we stayed in contact for, for several months. I would write her, she would write me back, and then my mom, uh, at the end of that year, she was going to come for uh, Christmas back to Switzerland to visit us for the first time. And I thought, well, uh, knowing, you know, we, we lived in a big apartment there, me and my brothers, and I said, uh, my mom is coming, so I invited her to come. I, I wanted her to meet my mother, and knowing she's an elder, elderly lady, I said, uh, bring anybody you want with you. And so she wrote me back and she said, well, I'm coming and I'm going to bring my uh, granddaughter. She's on college break and she's going to come and take the Euro train and, and travel throughout Europe and, and then fly back with me to, to, to the States. So anyway, make the story short, she came with her granddaughter and left without her. <laughs> with, in four days we were engaged and in one month we were married. <laughs> that's... that's uh, Next January will be 30 years. And, uh, uh, so that's, that's how I, I connected with someone who has the truth. So we, uh, we uh, uh, left, I left to Atlanta, I left Switzerland, went to Atlanta, and there I remember she invited me to her church. Uh, and they had a church up in the mountain and uh, uh, just felt the presence of God was so strong and people there were worshiping and praising God. I didn't know why these people were so excited and they were so happy, but uh, 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 there was something real in that place. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Well, I was just thinking while you were talking there, just trying to find that scripture in Isaiah where the Lord said, thus said the Holy One, the Redeemer of Israel. And he talks about how I knew you, I called you by name. And so many times in our life, it seems like that our enemy has such a great way of camouflaging his attacks to destroy our faith, right. to make us feel like that God is a million miles away from us. Yeah. But he's not. A book is written about our life. And, and if we can trust him and get close to him, he will see his work performed in our lives. And just sitting here listening to your testimony is just fascinating to me how even though your life is on the edge and it seemed like you could die anytime, uh, you just see the hand of God that 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 keeps directing the good the, the Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordained, ordered by God. Yeah. And so that is so awesome. Uh through all of this, you know, some of the background, I, I remember reading, I'm not really that old, but when I was a child, I, I was a voracious reader, still am a voracious reader, and I would read about Lebanon and Beirut, and it was it was one of the resorts of the world, and you, you've taken us places this last week, and even today, even in Biblos, you can see the beauty, you can see it one time. And, and even today, there are places that are just absolutely gorgeous. The Mediterranean is just beautiful. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, to go from that state into the war-torn uh, destruction and, and feeling the hopelessness of seeing people that you love killed right before your very eyes and... and, and and that constant barrage from hell to destroy our faith. And it's, it's a big deal. It is a big deal in our world today. Fear and hopelessness, is just, it just runs rampant. It's a worse pandemic than, than the coronavirus pandemic right. in our world. So, uh, you know, while you're talking, I just feel and I, and I see the hand of God so much in that. Uh, so you were baptized in Jesus' name. Right. Fill the Holy Ghost in Georgia. Right. Uh, I think you told me Brother Tim Copeland was your pastor. In right. And uh, Georgia, shout out to the Copelands, very dear friends of ours for many, many years. Yes. Um, 
So bring us to how God brought you. You said you would never come back to me. Exactly. <laughs> Once you got on that airplane. And, and show us how the hand of God has just molded and shaped your life. What was it that, that stirred your heart and brought you back to this land? Well, it was truth. You know, I, 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 uh, I found truth and has changed my life. And uh, after I got the Holy Ghost, uh, six months later, I saved a little money. And I, uh, of course, I've, I've called my brothers and told them about it. And uh, so I flew back to Lebanon. I shared the gospel with my brothers and, uh, and with my parents. I baptized one of my brothers at that time. I baptized my mom. And, and uh, my brothers got the Holy Ghost, and, uh, and every every. By the way, I got to see your mom today. I didn't get to talk to her. Yes. I wanted to so much. Yes. She seemed like a sweet lady. I didn't want to interrupt you. Thank you. No, that's all right. I'm thankful for them. My dad, my dad passed away 13 years ago, but he had the Holy Ghost and was baptized in Jesus' name. And uh, so every six months, every year, I would save up money and come back to Lebanon to share the gospel. And and I did not mind doing that. But uh, in 2012, uh, I was visiting here, and, and uh, God had given us several people in, in Peru that has been baptized at the Holy Ghost. And when I was there, uh, God, God really uh, spoke to my heart and told me about coming back to plant a church here. You know, I, I, I believe that, that church is essential for salvation. Yes, and, I believe that. All these people who are here in Lebanon, they, they needed a church. And uh, of course, that shook me to the core because uh, I didn't mind coming on trips, but to come back to Lebanon, to move back and bring my little children and raise them in a place where it's very unstable and uh, uh, the memories of the war is still in, my, in, in, still in the back of my mind. And, uh, I definitely did not want my family to be exposed to anything like that. And uh, so I prayed and I said, I said, God, if you want me to come back to Lebanon, I want to know that you've, you've, got, you've got me covered and got my family covered. And uh, at that time, the war in Syria was raging. ISIS was on the rise. They were already on the border of Lebanon. They were going into Iraq. And uh, uh, Lebanon was, was uh, seeing uh, suicide bombers, car bombers. In different places. It was really a very uh, hot spot to come to. I think Lebanon has always been a hot spot, but that was a high, high time. But uh, while I was praying and seeking God, I was with some friends in downtown Beirut. The day before I head back to Lebanon, uh, we were we were on, in downtown Beirut waiting on our bus to come and take us. And while we were waiting for the van to come by, one of our friends who was with us shouted out to us where well, first he took that picture and then he called shouted us to, to us and i asked him why did you take the picture and he said well look it's raining everywhere but not where we're standing and i looked up and and yeah there was rain everywhere there was no arm there was no cover and all around us it was just a circle of dry there was no rain all around us and i pointed out to him and i said you're right it's raining everywhere, but not where we're standing. And this is when God spoke to me. He said that uh, to come back to Lebanon, that he has us covered. And so I, I decided to come back to Lebanon, bring my family back. And of course, I have that picture right there on my desk. And we have it enlarged. And uh, uh, so every time things get heated up in Lebanon, I said, God, you promised. <laughs> so right there. And you know what? God has been faithful. We, we, we have... So we came back to Lebanon, started the church. A lot of things had happened, but God had, had kept his word. And today we celebrated our eighth anniversary of the church. And I tell you, God has been faithful this last eight years. He kept us safe from car bombs, from troubles, from ISIS. He kept us safe uh, from many dangers. And there is a church in Lebanon. You said something that really piqued my attention because there were a lot of young men and young ladies, and that God is called in the ministry. And uh, I'm sitting here looking at the same picture, and all the way around you is wet pavement, except for where you're standing. It almost looks like there's a 
canopy over your head, and there's not. You took me and showed right. me the very spot right. where you were standing, and there's no canopy there. It's right. open sky. But it is an extremely important thing. I believe that God calls men and women to certain ministries, and sometimes that ministry is to certain places. Right. Uh, we see in the Bible where the Paul wanted to go into uh, Asia, but he was forbidden by the Holy Ghost. But he had a dream, and in that dream, uh, he uh, saw a man that said, come on over here to Macedonia. And when he gets over there, it's not a man, it's a woman. Yeah. Nevertheless, the hand of God opened that door for him. And I believe what you said, Brother Azar, is so important. Because there's going to be times where you're going to be tried. And Satan's going to do his best to talk us out of doing what God has called us to do. Right. And he will use every situation. It's at those times that you have those reminders. God brought me here. Mm -hmm. And he will make a way for us. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, that is extremely important for people to know when they're being called by God. So he brought you back. We did celebrate with you eight years. Congratulations, by Thank the way, you. on Thank you. eight years of tremendous ministry. You have such a beautiful family. Thank you. And uh, we have just had a wonderful time here. But, uh, you know, your families, some of your families here tonight, even though we're doing this broadcast, one of them is, is Brother Jacob, who is also in the ministry. So we have a ton of young people that listen and watch this. And would love for Brother Jacob to speak to us. You know, he is called of God, tremendous minister. I've heard him preach, excellent preacher. And uh, so, Brother Jacob, we're thrilled to have you on Double Portion Podcast. And uh, we're just so glad that you consented to be a part of this. Talk to us about, you know, what it's like to, uh, you did grow up in the United States. A lot of your schooling took place there. And then your mom and dad picked you guys up and moved you all the way around the world to a new place. So speak to us a little bit about that and how the Lord has helped you, given you direction on. And, and, and just talk to us about how you your life is so incorporated in the ministry that God has called your parents to. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Bishop Oder. And I uh, just want to say I have been following the podcast for a long time on Instagram and I'm a big fan. And um, it's true. I spent um, I spent about three years of my school, um, kind of my middle school, and then two years of my high school um, here in Lebanon. And then I graduated high school here, and I also went to college here for four years. And um, through it all, you know, just um, it was, uh, you know, we, we came to Lebanon first in 2000, uh, 2006, and um, we were here for about a year. And I remember during that time, uh, you know, we had great church, we had um, revival, we had people getting the Holy Ghost. Um, and the, the reason that we had to leave for a little while was because we had a vision that there was, my, my dad had a vision there was a war coming. And um, so through that time in between, whenever we, we left and before we came back, people would ask me, do you think you're gonna go to Lebanon again? You know, and uh, do you think that you'll ever go back? And at the time it was, a, it was an uncertain question. I don't think any of us really knew uh, exactly what the plan of God was. But I would always tell everybody, I know that I'm going to be going back. I, I have it, I feel it in my heart. And I'd be praying for revival here in Lebanon. And so when we came back, it, was, uh, it, was, it wasn't easy um, first getting back and getting integrated. And there was a lot going on in the country. There was times when we'd be driving through 
uh, downtown Beirut. Um, we'd be on a certain street. And literally at that time in 2013, with ISIS being in the country, literally there was just a couple hours between us and a car bomb that would happen on that street that would kill, uh, you know, somewhere around 100 to 200 people. And so that was different from anything that I've experienced ever uh, in the U.S. before, you know. But um, I prayed and I asked God, uh, I said, Lord, if you, you know, if you want me to be, uh, to be here and to do the work that you're calling us to do, I'm praying that you would equip me and that you would help me in order to, to do whatever I can while I'm here. And, um, and it, God just started moving on my behalf. I started, I started learning the language a lot faster, a lot easier. And, uh, I was able to start giving my first Bible studies, um, just to some of the new people that were in our church. Uh, you know, I was like 17 or 18 years old and my Arabic was kind of broken. You know, but just I could show them in the Bible and we could go through it. And, um, and uh, you know, there was a lot of, there was a couple times where, you know, you feel like you're the only um, Holy Ghost filled young person almost in the country. You know, I didn't know of any Holy Ghost filled people really um, that were my age, that were um, even in the region at the time. You know, there was... Uh, this was something that was happening, that we were uh, plowing through, that we were starting. And so developing my walk with the Lord during that time, it was just a, a matter of uh, really learning uh, a daily walk with God, learning a daily prayer, daily Bible reading. And, um, and preach my first message here. Um, you know, Dad asked me, he said, are you... Are you willing to preach tonight? You know, and I had had a message ready and uh, I had a great title, you know, but everything else was something that, uh, you know, I'm thankful that, <laughs> thankful that we moved past from that, that stage. But, uh, uh, but really this has been the developing grounds for, um, for my, for, for the ministry um, that you might see somewhere else or, you know, this is where the battles have been fought. This is where uh, things have been determined. And uh, and so I'm thankful because I had an opportunity to be here in the mission field and from a young age and to start uh, learning to walk with the Lord. How old were you when you preached your first message? Well, I was here in Lebanon. I was, I was 17 years old, preached about a cow's heart. And I don't remember much about it besides <laughs> that. <laughs> it's funny you say that. I was 16 when I preached my first message, and I still remember it. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, but the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. So uh, God don't change his mind when he calls us. He doesn't only call us, but he empowers us. So, uh, you know, Brother Azar, Brother Jacob, I think in this last days, it's going to take young people that have courage. And courage is not a place where there is no fear. There is fear. Courage is overcoming that fear to do what is right. So you've been here as a young person. You've seen car bombs. In fact, Brother Zar, you and your family took, took us down to where that bomb just exploded, what was it, three years ago, two years three ago. Years. Massive. It's still to this day, the damage is just unimaginable. And, you know, I saw pictures of it when I was reading the news in the U.S., but seeing pictures and going and seeing how that absolutely changed the economy of the whole nation. Right. just threw this nation into chaos, just that one explosion, you know. Yeah. Um, and how that is still affecting you as they investigate, affecting this nation. So, Brother Jacob, talk to us about the fear. We, we have young people that are dealing with fear. And, and fear can...
can just cause blind panic and talk to us about how God helped you and what what ways did God show you to help you have the courage to walk through that valley, even though, uh, you know, you knew, I mean, literally, your life was on the line. There, there's young people that are maybe not in that drastic of a position, but they may be. They may be. Their life is on the line with addictions and stuff. But they know that they are in such a position that the next decision they make may may bring death, may bring life. So talk about how God helped you develop the courage in these situations as a young person. Yes, sir. And uh, that's so true. No matter where you are, um, you're going to be facing some of the same battles all, you know, no matter where you are. And um, I like the way my pastor says it. He says, it's better to be, you know, in Beirut, Lebanon, in the will of God, than it, than it is to be outside, you know, in the U.S. somewhere outside of the will of God. You know, you're walking with God as a, you know, I've learned it's a step-by-step -step process. And um, in reference to having to face the spirit of fear and um, the intimidation tactics that the enemy wants to play with people that are called and and, and God has a purpose and a, and a direction for their life. Um, there's going to be key moments that you'll face um, where they're going to be really tests that determine whether or not you're going to the next level, you know, whether or not you're going to. Um, and not only that, but they, um, their opportunities and their chances uh, for God to really show his glory, you know, in the depths of the sea, that's where the fishermen see the the wonders of God, and um, I can I can I can recall two times where there's really been a battle that I've had with the spirit of fear that tried to step in, and the first time I was 17 years old, um, it was just a few months after I had preached my first message. But, you know, we were just coming out on the fit on the mission field, and um, and so we were doing. Uh, our best to get the work started, um, to get it, uh, um, you know, to raise funds to be able to continue here. And at that time, it was kind of like a month to month situation uh, in 2013, 2014. And so um, there was a period when my pastor and our family, they had to go back to the U.S. Uh, for a little while. And that's one of the that's one of the great um difficulties of being a missionary is if you have to leave on deputation, you know, in order to raise funds and come back. Well, um, I was, um, after I preached my first message, I was uh, graduated to holding down the fork here in Lebanon while the deputation happened. So, uh, and that was, uh, that was a blessing. And it was also a, uh, an opportunity to bear the yoke, you know, in my youth, to start early. But I remember being 17 years old and, and this, uh, you know, it had to happen and the family uh, traveled for about two weeks and it just so happened that those two weeks were during my finals in high school. Yeah. But I was going to be responsible for uh, Wednesday night service, Saturday night prayer, whenever we did prayer and Sunday service. And then also I was having to do finals at the time. And I remember being by myself in the house and um, just getting on my knees to pray. And when I would pray, I'd feel like there was just something terrible that was in the room or standing behind me. I'd be afraid to look around or turn around. And it was just that spirit of fear, knowing that you're one of the only Holy Ghost filled people in the entire country, you know. And, um, and even through those battles and those times when you're just working it out and trying to connect with God um, despite the attacks of the enemy and the, the tactics he likes to play on your mind and on your faith. Um, still, there would be, there would never be any of those valleys or any of those times when I wouldn't be able to still feel a comfort of the Holy Ghost or see God do something that I knew 
was not a, res a result of my prayers or not a result of my level of confidence or my level of, um, of boldness, but really just a result of God letting me know I am with you. And, uh, and no matter what you're going to go through, uh, I'm going to stand with you. And so that was a great comfort. There was one time I had decided to start a fast and, um, it was just happened to be during Ramadan. I was driving up the highway right outside here and a car out of nowhere came and, and bumped into the back of me, uh, my car, as we're going up the highway. And this person proceeded to try and drive me into the wall of the highway. And it was just an attack of the enemy. I had decided to start fasting that day and the enemy is coming in to attack me. And again, I was one of, I think it was the time where I was, uh, I was in the country by myself. And uh, God gave me wisdom. I headed towards a military base. And once I got close to the military base, this car didn't want to uh, be caught on camera or be near me while they were trying to ram me into the side of the highway wall. And they took off and continued. And I was just like panicked within, you know, here I am. My goodness, I'm, big, you know, this is a big deal. And, uh, and so I, I slowly made my way to continue driving back home. And I'm praying along the way. And as I'm praying, another car drives up beside me. And I look over and, you know, of course, I'm like, oh, boy, here we go again. And I looked over and it was one of my one of my close friends from high school. And he just waves at me and he he says, hey, you know, and uh, and I waved at him. And I, it was like it was like it was almost as if it was a moment where I mean, out of nowhere, somebody God let me know, hey, you know, I've still got people around you. I've still got angels around you. And it just brought me out of that moment and just gave me a sense of, Hey, uh, God's got you covered. And there's people that he can pull up at any time. That'll be right there with you. Um, and you don't have to be afraid, but you just keep on keeping the course. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, while you're talking to brother Zar, brother Jacob, I read here, uh, God uses young men and young ladies. And some of the greatest feats in the world were done by young people. Many people don't know that the whole nation of France was started by a 16-year-old girl. Her name was Joan of Arc. She was 16 years old. And she felt like that it was the call of God in her life to bring all those city-states together to make the nation of France. It's a quite a story if you read it. Uh, Isaiah was about 15 years old the first time that he prophesied. Many scholars believe these words of Jeremiah where he said, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. That happened when Jeremiah was 13 years old. Wow. And, and these calls of God, Esther was probably 15 years old, when she saved the whole race of the Jews from from the annihilation of of Haman and her grandpa was Saul and Haman's grandpa was Agag mm -hmm. and where Saul didn't accomplish what he was supposed to his 16 year old granddaughter did and when she gets done you never read about Agag ever again in the Bible. And so God uses young men and young ladies to, to do great things. And uh, I, I know that there are many young men and young ladies that are listening to this podcast and, uh, and God's going to give them the courage to stand up to become who God has called them to become. Uh, man, I could go on and on. There's so much more I want to talk about. And, uh, and, and we need to do this again. Only the next time I want the videos in where mm -hmm. we can really uh, sit down and discuss and talk. You've taken us to, I would love to get started on some of the stuff that you showed us here in Lebanon. We went to the city of Tyre and Sidon. Mm -hmm. which are biblical cities 
and you took us up to a city that I, I've studied history for years and never read about, uh, what, how do I pronounce Baalbek? Baalbek, which right. is one of the original places of the worship of Baal. Right. And, uh, and then today you took us to the beautiful city of Biblios. And just so much to talk about, so much Bible here and, and the geography of, again, being in places where Jesus walked mm -hmm. and Jesus right. ministered is such a wonderful thing. And let me say from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of my wife and my daughter, thank you for the incredible hospitality that you extended to us this last week. Uh, to those of you that are listening, they have a wonderful church, the Holy Ghost Mode. I think we, I know of at least two that received the Holy Ghost this week. And we baptized one this morning. That's and right. revival is still progressing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would love to come back and talk about the vision that God has given you, that not only will there be a great church here in Beirut, but that revival is going to extend all over this nation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to do that. We want to have opportunity again to sit down with you. Uh, maybe if you're in the States or whatever, we can Absolutely. do it there. But I do want to extend a wonderful thank you for your hospitality and for taking the time this evening to come on Double Portion Podcast and spending time with us. It was uh, a privilege and honor. We, we do love your family and we do pray for you. And uh, we encourage those of you that are listening. Uh, do you have a website that, that we can, uh, they can go to and, and maybe view your services? or whatever, talk, yes, talk about some ways that they can come in contact with you. Absolutely. We do have a blog that we post <coughs> uh, everything on a weekly basis, almost what God's been doing in our church and in Lebanon, in Egypt and in Iraq. It's uh, the name of the website. It's memissions.org, memissions.org, and you can subscribe and, to it as well. We're also on, on Facebook and Instagram. We have, we have, uh, uh, an account for the church and the mission work on it. You can find that under uh, um, Apostolics of Beirut, and uh, would love would love for uh, for you to connect with us uh, on social media and uh, pray pray that God continue to give us favor and give us souls here in the Middle East. To all of our pastors that are listening to this, uh, we encourage you to support the sisters. Are this is a great work. These are wonderful apostolic people. And uh, they can use our prayer. They can use our support. Uh, brothers, Azar, brother Azar and brother Jacob, and to your family, we love you. Love you too. We're praying for you all. Thank and you. we're believing God with you that God Amen. will show a great revival. We will be back with you on Double Portion Podcast. Amen. I assure you. Uh, to all of our listeners, today it's all listeners because we don't have video. Thank you again for being with us on Double Portion Podcast. Uh, we love you. Our producer today is Sister Rayanna Hicks instead of Jordan Pound. Bring uh, it on. <laughs> thank you. She's the one. Yeah, shout out to Bring It On if you have, your children want a great children's podcast. Mm -hmm. Tune in to Holy Ghost Radio or Bring It On. And uh, she is uh, producing this for us tonight. And uh, we love y'all. Thank you for being a part of the portion family. And uh, I guess it's peace out. God bless y'all. Show.